Three, two, one, and we're live. Bom, bom, bom. No dab today? Nah, we'll nah. save the dab for another time. Save the dab another <laughs> Exactly. So we're back. So we, so we have invited uh, Henry Barlow back. So just for people who maybe didn't watch the last episode for some absurd reason, um, he has a bachelor's bachelor of science in nutrition and is a registered associate nutritionist. And then he's also competed in multiple bodybuilding competitions. So today we're going to be covering sort of eating habits and diets that are quite popular sort of around at the moment and kind of talking through the pros and cons and just trying to give everyone as much information about these particular things as possible. Uh, so first I wanted to go with you into intermittent fasting. So for anyone who doesn't know, essentially intermittent fasting is eating patterns that cycle between periods of fasting and eating. Uh, so it doesn't specify what food you should be eating during those periods and there's different types of fasting that you can do. <clears throat> so the main three sort of most popular methods, you've got the 16 slash 8 method, also known as uh, lean gains. Yes. Uh, so basically on that one you skip breakfast and you're trying to restrict eating to sort of 8 hour periods. So for example from 1pm to 9pm. Mm. Uh, then you also have the eat stop eat method. Um, so in this particular method, you would be fasting for 24 hours, uh, once or twice a week. So again, you're just not eating dinner one day until the next. Um, and then the, finally, the 5-2 diet. So on two non-consecutive days, uh, people will consume anywhere from 500 to 600 calories uh, throughout a week. So just to reiterate, twice a week on non-consecutive days, you would have 500 to 600 calories and then eat normally for the rest of the week. Mm. So, I mean, funny enough, so I mean, I mentioned to you guys earlier that I've been trying to intermittent fasting and Henry's already bowing his head. Shame. So, Shame. <laughs> so, that was Cersei in the streets. <laughs> so, so, basically, the. <laughs> so, the 16 to 8 one is one I was trying. So, there's an application you can get, which is called. So, it's called Zero, um, in which there it can allow you to do the timing for it. So you can obviously say when you want to start your fast, when you want to end it and whatnot, but it'll obviously just give you the timing, it'll give you like little merits every time you've completed your fast and everything as well. Um, so yeah, the one that I went for was the 16 to 8. And yeah, before Henry rips into me, I just wanted, I mean, I've only been doing it for the past two days, to be honest, so I can't really say that I'm religiously doing it. But from what I've personally felt from it, I haven't felt too much difference apart from like when I wake up in the mornings, I do feel a bit more like awake, like I'm ready to do stuff rather than kind of groggy straight after breakfast. Um, I think it's good when it comes to me not snacking as much, like eating different types of snacks and whatnot, you know, like past seven o'clock. So just to reiterate, so when I start the fast was around about 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. is when I, so no, when I start eating, start eating sorry, exactly. When I start eating is 11. Um, obviously, I have my breakfast and I eat throughout then to about, I think it's seven, yeah, around seven o'clock. And then from there, yeah, obviously, just start your fast, click on the application. Um, and then, yeah, I personally think for me, that's actually helped me kind of stop kind of the snacking, eating late, and it actually has helped my sleep a little bit. So, those are the pros that I'm going to do. But I, I mean, I can't say long enough how it's actually helped me. I don't know what I'm trying to well, achieve. Two days, you yeah, pretty much. So I can't really say much on that. But from what I felt, at least it's helped me stop me from snacking and doing things like that. Yeah. But now Henry's going to rip into me, so. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm not going to rip into you. But I think it's important to explain mm. so how how diets work. So if obviously you're going in going in for weight loss, so that's weight loss, not fat loss. The two things are different. <clears throat> so obviously when you're losing weight you'll be losing both uh, muscle and fat, okay? So generally when you lose weight, you lose uh, fat and muscle in a ratio of three to one, respectively. Okay, Hold on. which one, fat or muscle? Uh, fat, but yeah, obviously for every three parts uh, fat you lose, you lose one part muscle, okay? So yeah, RIP gains. <coughs> but um, obviously, now when we talk about fat loss, there are things that you can do obviously with your, your nutrition to help to shift that, that um, shift that ratio to slightly uh, favor fat loss rather than muscle loss. Um, so obviously, you know, can, you know, consuming protein fairly regularly is gonna help you to achieve that. Um, so how is a weight loss diet going to work? So it's gonna work by placing yourself in a, in a calorie deficit. I'm yeah. sure everybody's heard about that, calories in, calories out. Okay, so if you're consuming less calories, 
then you are you are burning throughout the day uh, through just your basal metabolic rate, which is just you surviving, just doing nothing for the day, and your activity throughout the day, which uses calories as well. If you're consuming less calories than that, then over time you will lose weight. Okay, so these intermittent fasting diets in terms of weight loss mm. are working by placing you in a calorie deficit by restricting the times in which you can eat. Right. But you were saying that they don't specify what you should be eating throughout that window. Yeah. Is that that's, that's what I was saying, yeah. And I, I think as well, it's like, the reason I want to talk about intermittent fasting is because it's like, there's a lot of hype around it. Like, it's almost like intermittent fasting is the one. Yeah. Like, it's like almost like gospel. Like, this mm -hmm. is the go-to diet. It's going to get the best results no matter what sort of thing. That's why I feel like this kind of media and uh, sort of things I've seen from kind of people posting about it, which is why I was interested to sort of chat in a bit more depth about it because I can't imagine like, that's necessary. You've got like Terry Crews and like celebrities and everything that do yeah, it. And yeah. like, yeah, and then like you say, it's a big thing. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I think from that point of view, it's, uh, the, like I said in our pre previous podcast, the, the best diet for you is always going to be the diet that you can easily adhere to so mm -hmm. one you want to do now because you have these eating windows it's not specified what you can eat within yeah. that window so yeah, you can yeah. eat more freely that means you can if you wanted to you could have your mcdonald's you could have your your pizza and stuff which isn't necessarily yeah. healthy for you but obviously if you're in a calorie deficit you can still achieve some degree of weight loss hence i'm using weight loss there not fat loss okay yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> but yeah so if you if you can find a diet easy for you to for you to do and you have more freedom with uh what you can eat within a certain window then of course that's going to be more desirable for you. i do feel my concern with something like and fasting would be that because people aren't probably going to especially like if they're not like you know training for competitions like yourself that sort of thing they're probably not going to be counting calories so like you kind of just said what they'll probably do is be like well, I've got eight hours, so I'm just going to fucking smash as much food as I can. And they might even actually be consuming more calories than they need anyway, still within that window. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. I feel like it's more of like an example of an eating habit rather than a diet because they don't specify what you should probably be eating. Yeah, exactly. Like you, it's very easy to overeat if you have, if you have developed cravings yeah. uh, throughout your period of fasting. And then when you start laying into food, you think, oh, I want this, this, and this. Yeah. And you can quite rapidly exceed your calorie uh, calorie intake if, if, if that's what you're doing. But the other thing I would say, you mentioned habit there. And I think that you're, you're treading on very dangerous ground here where you can start to um, encourage very poor eating habits and a very bad relationship with food. Uh, yeah. So where you'll have people, okay, well you can't eat for this period of time, but then you can eat as much as you can in this window. And so there, yeah, you, yeah. you you could start to bring on some some eating disorders, yeah. such as you know you know bulimia and uh, binge eating disorder, where you just absolutely destroy food in a very short window of time, and that can you know yeah. that can affect you not only your health but it can affect your your, your your mental health as well. And we that that I that's not very healthy for you to be doing. I think that would be relevant for all three of those examples I gave before as well, because even like one of them, you only consuming five to six hundred calories in a day twice. You do that in a yeah. week, like so. That's yeah. Five days you're eating normally, mm. and then two days out of those weeks, you have, and also as well, my argument, especially for like well, people like all three of us, you know, we train yeah. nearly every day. Yeah. Well, so you're going to do a friggin' workout, five hundred calories a day. No. Like <clears throat> Jesus, bro. And then I even mean, there's another one where you, you're fasting for twenty four hours, again once or twice yeah. a week, so you're not eating anything. See, how are you going to do like a hefty weight session, or even like a, a cardio metcon hit session on zero food, man? That's the thing. I was a bit worried because I was going to try and go for a run this morning. Obviously, from fast, you're always smiling and like watching me, ready to go. But um, I mean, literally, like, obviously, because I started the fast at 7 p.m. last night. Yeah. I was still quite wide awake, but I was a bit scared at the same time whether I should go for a run. Because I'm thinking, would it be beneficial for me to still go for a run if I've not eaten any, anything? I think a fasted job probably wouldn't be as bad. I'm more thinking, like, or if you're doing like weights or doing some yeah, kind like of. Yeah, if you're doing like a hefty <clears throat> weight session, you haven't eaten in 24 hours. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if I like, pass out when you're deadlifts or some shit. Mm. But I think, to be fair as well, I like looking at those three, I think the one you're doing is probably the safest method. Mm. I don't know what you think, but like, just because you're still eating consistently eight hours, you have eight hour That's periods what I'm a day. That's you are, but like, well, the yeah. ones where you're, you're fasting and having nothing to eat for one to two days a week. Yeah. Like I said, how would you, how would you even train around that? Yeah. Like I would not be comfortable doing any form of exercise if I haven't eaten for 24 hours. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I think it's, it's for, for me personally, the pros that I saw from it was pretty much, I think it, yeah, maybe it might, I think it's good at keeping a structure for yourself. I think it's just like an extreme way of pretty much saying, 
okay, look, no snacking at night time. You eat your dinner and then yeah, you yeah. give your space of time before you go to bed. Yeah, it's like yeah. a discipline thing. <clears throat> I think religiously doing it, I don't think you need to personally, but I think it was good for me just to kind of make sure that I just eat dinner a bit earlier and I pretty much just, you know what I mean, just eat at the right times basically. Have like a, and it, it does help you structure your day when it comes to eating and having like, say each day you'll eat at this time, that time. You're just smiling at me. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, 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 what are you? Like, okay. like, you need to give us your honest opinion, pros and cons. Well, yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah, well, it, it, so, 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 so pros and cons, yes, the intermittent fasting, uh, you know, you plan and strategy can work. Mm. Um, just all simply, three or simply, just the 16-8? I, I would say the 16 to 8, but it, you know, all three are trying to work on that same principle where you're trying to, you're trying to have a calorie deficit. Now, the, 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 the 5 2 that you were saying, or where you eat normally yeah. throughout those days, obviously, you're only going to be in a calorie deficit for a couple of days, but it's going to be pretty brutal on those days. Yeah. Now, generally, when you, you're performing sustainable, sustainable, fat loss or weight loss yeah. um, you would do that over a, a, an extended period of time that that calorie deficit and it doesn't have to be so dramatic yeah okay um, but but you know shocking the body like that on a couple of days a week is just, just I random days as well yeah it's, it's just I think it's gonna it's gonna hinder you it's definitely gonna hinder your performance and it's it's not sustainable generally speaking but if you find I think that eight to you were saying the eight to sixteen, so yeah. sixteen to eight, yeah, sixteen yeah. to eight, yeah. I think that that's slightly more sustainable. Yeah. I think if that's easier for people to do, mm. then that's fantastic, and you can you can do that. And if that's ha- if you if you're enjoying that, then that's great. Yeah. But I think um, what was it you were saying? Teaching you discipline. Yeah. But then I feel like that's just a false reality in a sense. Where if you were actually disciplined, you would be, you know eating healthier foods and counting your calories and having breakfast lunch and having dinner. breakfast lunch and dinner correctly <clears throat> to fuel your body as your body needs to be That's fueled point, yeah. and especially i think for for, for 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 weight loss less so but it, for fat loss it's more, much more important particularly when performance is concerned and we mentioned last time about protein and how protein um reacts within the body in terms of you know we can store our our, our Carbs as glycogen, we can store our fats as fat tissue. We cannot store protein. Mm. And so similarly with our water soluble vitamins, it's important that we have multiple meals throughout the day which contain protein in order to keep taking in protein, to keep fueling the body with protein for growth and repair. And yeah, so yeah, yeah, so I guess like if you trained at like six PM Yeah. And then you had like one meal left. Or maybe even none in your case. If you'd finished training at 7.30, you wouldn't be able to eat again. No, that's what I'm saying. So then that whole night, you don't really have any sort of protein intake to help your muscles recover, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, so obviously if you've only got a, a, a very small eating window, your the amount of meals that you can you know, feasibly get within that window where you've, got, where you're getting good quality protein yeah. in your, in, 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 into your body that your body can actually absorb from that meal. Mm-hmm. So in each meal, generally the body, on average, can, can consume, can absorb about 25 grams of protein, give or take. Obviously there's variability within the population, but that's sort of the average, yeah. sort of higher level. Okay, so then how many, how many grams of protein are you realistically gonna be able to actually absorb from the meals that you consume within those eight hours? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. But each time you consume a meal which contains protein, obviously, the, the amino acids in your blood, they increase. So obviously the protein that's absorbed increases in your body. And then your rate of protein synthesis, so that the, the rate at which your body is able to grow and repair, that increases also following the trend given by the amino acids in the blood, mm-hmm. okay? But then once that the, the amino acids in the blood start to tail off, the protein synthesis rate follows that and drops off as well into a negative state where your body then starts using protein from muscle tissue and other tissue that contains protein uh, for other purposes that it needs it for more urgently. Okay, so there you go through a cycle, what we were saying earlier, where you go into a flux, so you get peaks and troughs throughout the day. If you're doing intermittent fasting. Or regardless, doing regardless. Yeah. Okay, so in, I, in an ideal world, in order to you know, maintain muscle mass and to grow muscle mass, um, you want to be able to have more peaks throughout the day than you do troughs. So you have a net gain of protein synthesis over, uh, you know, protein losses. So with regards to, you know, intermittent fasting, you're really limiting how many peaks you can, you know, theoretically and feasibly get achieve within that window. Yeah. I mean, eight hours gives you slightly more time. But then again, you know, realistically, how many times you're going to want to eat a meal 
within, within those eight hours. And are you realistically going to want to eat, you know, decent meals within those eight hours? And also, you from what you're saying, you can only your body can on average only intake 25 grams of protein per hour, or would it be even longer than that? The time for uh, gaps? Yeah, so per, per, per meal is what it's is, is what it's saying. But that will last, yeah, for for about an hour to two hour period. So you, because yeah, even when I think about it now, like I would be eating over a period, like per day, I would probably be eating over a period of like twelve hours at least. Yeah, Con- like obviously, like obviously gaps in between, but pretty much consistently eating over twelve hours. So that's an extra, and that's that's sort of on the lower end. So that's like an extra four hours a day mm-hmm. yeah. to consume what my body needs. Yeah. Exactly. But what about, okay, so say there's some people that don't do it for weight loss, they do it for like mental clarity, for example, or just to kind of, you know, be more focused or feel more energized. Like, do you know, do you know anything about that, where it comes from? You know how some people say they feel energy, say in the mornings when they don't eat. For example, I did feel more energized. I don't know if that's just because I was kind of hungry in a way that I was just like, I can't wait till 11 o'clock to eat something. So I'm kind of like, you know, you just kind of get up and go and... That might be to do with digestion, wouldn't it? So yeah, yeah. So that, that's more to do with digestion. So obviously, if you have, if you have breakfast and you say you feel quite cloudy and yeah. claggy after you had your meal, yeah. your meal is probably likely to contain quite a high level of carbohydrates. Yeah. And so, like we were saying in our last one, you're having that really heavy insulin spike, mm. that insulin response to that meal that you've just consumed, mm. and that is going to make you feel a bit more sleepy and a bit more groggy. Whereas if you pay, if you you change what you had for breakfast, for example, then you wouldn't feel quite so quite so groggy mm. and so fatigued throughout the day, you would feel more alert and, yeah, and yeah. on it. The other thing I would say is that obviously, when you, you know, if you're remaining um, fasted and you're saying that you're feeling energized, mm. you know, that isn't necessarily to that actually being energy available. Yeah, because that's what I'm worried about, yeah. like using, is it taking away stores of like energy that are not actually meant to be used, if you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? It's like, the, I don't know if the body's taking away some of the energy. So you mean like actually taking away like some of your reserve fats? Yeah, or like there's some kind of adrenal, uh, like adrenaline that is yeah. being used instead of my, you know, yeah. like so the foods that are being burned. Yeah. In, in extreme cases, your body will start to resort to using adrenaline um, to, to sort of give you, give you a bit of spark. But the trouble is, is you will, you will eventually start to feel adrenal fatigue and that is then going to impact your sleeping pattern and imp- impact your athletic performance Damn. later down the line. Damn, but, okay. then, but then there's obviously the intermittent fasters that say that actually, you know, it's the opposite, it actually boosts your performance and whatnot, a lot of them say that, or mm-hmm. some of them will go and do the workout that they're meant to do and not eat till like two o'clock in the afternoon, so it's interesting to say that actually it does affect your sleeping pattern and you're like, your In a negative way. Yeah, yeah, in a negative way. Yeah, 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 over time it will start to, you know, impact it in a negative way. I think the, you know, what we should be trying to promote, you know, not just in the health and fitness industry, but you know, generally, is you know, is trying to, you know, make sure that everybody's got a nice, healthy relationship with food, mm. and you know, understanding, you know, eating eating meals that you know you're giving your body what it needs, as it, as it needs it, you know. Mm. And if you're if you're trying to achieve weight, you know, weight loss, I think it's better to be striving for fat loss rather than weight loss. Yeah. Um, and you know, t- targeting that a bit more efficiently rather than just broadly weight loss. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we're if we're just targeting broadly weight loss, you're losing fat and muscle. It's just it's, just, it's a lot more. You, you're putting your body on a lot more stress. It just isn't necessary, particularly plummeting your body into a into a serious calorie deficit, yeah. which just isn't necessary to yeah. achieve what you're trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, the problem is people just aren't patient enough to do it over a longer period. So that's probably why they True. resort yeah. to sort of drastic calorie deficits, and they, I just feel like they don't actually understand the negatives of doing that, yeah. especially longer term. Like, but I was I was going to ask as well: Is there anyone you would actually say? Or recommend like intermittent fasting too, like any particular type of person with maybe like, like diet issues or sort of certain things they're trying to achieve. Is there anyone you actually look at and be like, oh, intermittent fasting would be like a good option for you? Well, this is not necessarily. The thing is, is if that individual finds it easier to follow that kind of diet, yeah, and they they, they don't enjoy doing other diets, regardless of whether they're scientifically more effective. Mm-hmm. The diet that's always going to be more effective for that individual is the one that they believe in. Yeah, yeah. You get that placebo effect where people believe that it's going to work, and so they trust in the process. Yeah, and will do it. Mm. Okay, so if you have an individual where they're just like I did, all they want to do is intermittent fasting, then that is the way you're going to have to go. Mm. But in order to help you with your rates of protein synthesis, you can be a bit more meticulous with what proteins you use, and use different types of proteins within each meal. And so you get different kinds of protein complexity. So you have some proteins which are easier to digest, like your you know, egg and fish, 
yeah. uh, whey protein, for example, which is digested very quickly. And then you have more complicated proteins, like proteins present in, in beef, for example, um, and casein, which take a lot longer to digest. So they're going to slowly drip feed amino acids into your bloodstream for a longer period of time. Mm. So if you use uh, a, a, a mixture of different proteins, which you so, should be doing with a healthy, balanced diet anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in this case, you have to be a bit more meticulous. Yeah, so you'd have to be more meticulous that so, so that you can, yeah. through, especially considering your fasting period. So yeah. towards the end of your eating window, I would encourage you to consume more complicated proteins and then maybe even have a casein shake on top of that. Um, casein, casein, the protein has sort of a half life within the body of about nine hours. So okay. you're drip feeding your your yeah. body uh, amino acids, which particularly if you're going to be doing intermittent fasting with that narrow eating window, that would be really important to do that to try and optimize your your muscle recovery, particularly if you're training. Would yeah. You, sorry, would you say that say for example those longer lasting proteins such as the casein, would it be better to have those in the evening, for example, to allow them through your for when you're sleeping for them to be in your body and kind of so like. What so I'm sorry, I don't, know, I don't know if it would be better during the day to have those or like, you know, allow them throughout the day or literally as your dinner and then allow throughout the evening to them to kind of kick in. Is there any difference in kind of having it earlier or in the evening? I would, I would suggest that it's, yeah, more, it's more beneficial to have, if you're doing intermittent fasting, I would have those slower digesting proteins such as casein towards the end of your eating window. Yeah, so as, fasting your, period. as your last meal so that you're going to be... So you're going to have amino acids coming into your bloodstream during your fasting period to help you as much as you can to try and yeah. maintain <laughs> some, some rate of protein synthesis. I think we can do a dab after that sentence if you like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think, uh, um, what, I was gonna, what was I going to say as well? Shit, I forgot. Um, no, I think, to, to be fair, certain people in corporate environments, it probably would suit quite well. Because, like, you know, when they get up like 6 a.m. or mm. 7 a.m. and they've got to go to work, like if they're not training and doing weight sessions in the morning, maybe that would work better for them because they just get up, go to work, and then eat a little bit later in the day. Um, mm. So I can I can see why, like you said, certain people it might be a little bit better for. Yeah. But I think in terms of performance, would you say it's pretty fair to say you're much better off with sort of eating throughout the day rather than intermittent fasting? Yeah, absolutely. I think as far as performance is concerned, you're far better off eating a diet throughout the day mm -hmm. where you're having meals, you know, at decent, you know, sensible regular eat intervals. Mm -hmm. and not trying to fast yourself for extended periods of time yeah, and particularly not for 24 hours it's just not necessary yeah yeah and if you're if you're trying to optimize your performance this is yeah. but then again this is you know the, there's a difference between performance and somebody who's striving for weight loss yeah you know so with weight loss it's you know you you're just you're just looking for that 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 figure on the scale to drop whereas with you know fat loss you need to be a bit more meticulous again and that's going to give you better results you know in terms of health as well yeah. uh, but then with performance you've got to be yeah it's generally more advantageous to be having Meals steadily throughout the day sure. at sensible intervals. Well, I was just going to quickly ask, I know you're about to go on the next point. Um, for example, you know those people that intermittent fast um, and you know, obviously throughout the morning, I just see them drinking coffee. Mm. Does that, is that even intermittent fasting still? Because I feel like the coffee is absorbed differently. I know you can drink water throughout that fasting period. but I think know. they say you can drink like um, black coffees. Really? Yeah. Just black coffee? Yeah. But is that not technically still being digested and still being... But they've got like three calories per coffee, I think, or something. Really? Like a latte would probably wouldn't count. I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think like a latte or cappuccino wouldn't because it's got like milk and more calories in whereas like a yeah, right oh, oh, that makes sense yeah, yeah like, okay. it's just water and coffee beans so sure. it's like three calories per yeah I'm so not sure, but, yeah. yeah so Molly, you're absolutely right yeah so so black black coffee yeah dabbing out so black <laughs> black coffee you, you yeah you've got a very low you know pretty negligible amount of calories in there yeah. um but obviously with a, with a latte a much milkier coffee you're going to have a lot more calories in there and so you know technically you won't be fasting mm. um so but the other thing to you know we talked about adrenal fatigue earlier um with regards to you know uh, adrenaline in the morning and obviously mm. caffeine is a stimulant it's going to stimulate our bodies to secrete adrenaline which is all that buzz we get mm. okay so obviously if you're pounding the coffees in the morning you're really going to be you know biting into that adrenal fatigue and you know there's this it's only going to be a short, short period of time until sure. you know, that starts to negatively impact, you know, your performance and day to, and day to day life. Like your body's going to become very resistant to caffeine, and then you're not going to be able to sleep very well either. So, so even though intermittent fasting is probably even worse, to have coffee in the morning, basically, what you're saying. Well, no, it's it, regardless whether you're intermittent fasting or not. If you're pounding caffeine, that's yeah. just generally not very healthy for you. But because your adrenaline levels, like you said, are kind of already spiked a little bit, if you are fasting, yeah. having a coffee on top of that is yeah. more detrimental. Is that is that what you're saying? Or? No, not necessarily. Okay. I think, yeah, it's just generally, if you're going to, you know, 
you know, uh, replace that uh, Energies, you, en- en- energy yeah. with, with, you know, with coffee. You're, just, you're not really using, you, you know, you're not using up like, well, you, you are burning calories through, you know, the stored glycogen you have, yeah. the stored fats that you have. But obviously, like we mentioned last time, if you're depleting your glycogen before you've even started training, yeah. you're just completely, um, you know, you're already squandering your performance before you've even had a chance to perform in the gym or whether it's a sport that you're playing or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Damn. Okay, but you converted me after two days. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna scrap it up? Yeah. No, I mean, I just wanted to try it just to kind yeah. of see if there's any difference. And I mean, the problem is, I think a lot of people mainly do it for weight loss as well. Yeah. Um, I'm not really doing it for weight I don't really need to do it for weight loss. I feel like it's literally the only reason that, like, every time it's like, oh, I'll go do it to me fast and at least lose That's some weight. That's the thing, yeah. yeah. Or to get shredded or something. Or a lot yeah. of people say it's to boost their metabolism or make their metabolism more efficient. Yeah, that's, that's another good point, actually. What are your thoughts on that? Because that that's literally like the main cell Big point. one, yeah, they yeah. say, oh, it boosts your metabolism. Yeah. I could just see, see, Henry does the same kind of thing. Just like, I can't wait to drop the mic. Those eyes just kind of glaze over. Yeah. Like, Fuck yeah, no. but, uh, <laughs> yeah it's, just, it's just a lot of them that say it boosts your metabolism or makes your metabolism more efficient. I've seen a lot of that. Yeah, Even I'm the celebrities sure. say that, you know, and you see like Terry Crews, like all like shredded and everything. And you're like, isn't that true though? I mean, the guy's already really in good shape. So, you know, but yeah, yeah sorry, I'll let you. Kind of have your thoughts. Yeah. On so, that. with regards to your, your you know, the, the body's effect on its metabolism, I mean, your metabolism is pretty much going to stay consistent. You know, where your metabolism is going is, is going to change when you, you know, you alter your lean body mass. Mm. You know, if you increase your lean body mass, you increase your muscle tissue, your metabolism is going to increase. Simply by fasting, you're not going to be able to impact that. All right. So it's only okay. really through training. What you, and diet, what you yeah. will impact is your body's sensitivity to insulin. I think we talked about this before. Yeah. And your insulin is essentially a hormone your body secretes when you uh, ingest carbohydrates mainly, but also with protein as well. Right. And that basically helps you to absorb um, you know, uh, uh, amino acids and, and carbohydrates and uh, store carbohydrates in the cells. But also, it's also related to fat storage as well. Okay, so if you're fasting for an extended period of time, your body's going to develop, a, you know, quite a high level of uh, insulin, insulin sensitivity. So then when you have that meal, your body's going to be like, right, we need to, you know, replenish these glycogen storages a, a bit more efficiently. Not as efficiently as if you were to train, mm. deplete your glycogen storage, and then have a meal, right. your body's going to be very efficient in that. But yeah, because obviously you've got that glycemic window, which we talked about yeah. last time, and also your anabolic window, which your body is really... You know, it's it, it's really going to respond to that really well. So it's really more okay. just about what you eat, basically. Make sure what you eat, and just kind of just make sure you either. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is it going to increase your metabolism? No. If you change your if you change your lean body mass, mm. then yeah, you can mm. look to change your metabolism. Okay. Um, it will it increase insulin sens- sensitivity. Yes, a bit. Um, so that's going to make you slightly more efficient at storing carbohydrates as energy for later on for later usage. Mm. Um, but you can achieve that just through training and eating normally properly yeah. Yeah. yeah so i think to to to, to, to conclude intermittent fasting if it's something that you find that works the best for you then yeah sure do it but yeah obviously if you're looking to you know preserve your you know you know get get a decent level of performance make sure you're eating a, eating a variety of different proteins put some slightly more complicated proteins towards the end of your eating window to help Drip feed your muscle with amino acids so that you can continue to hold on to your muscle, which can help you in your performance later down the line the following day, um, for example. Okay, so if it's if it's something that works for you, then definitely do that. Would I say it's optimal for, for performance? No, it's not optimal for performance. Okay, eating a eating a sensible diet throughout the day. When I say sensible, you can yeah, interpret that how you will. Uh, but eating a, eating a diet which consists of you know say between you know three five three to five cents, you know, decent sized meals throughout the day where you're giving your body the nutrients that it requires to be able to perform optimally. So optimally, so it's, it's going to be more beneficial for an athlete if you're taking your training particularly seriously. Mm. Then, yeah, that would be the better route to go. Okay, cool. Uh, another one I wanted to talk to you about was the uh, carnivorous diet. So pretty interesting uh, for anyone who doesn't know carnivore diet. So basically that literally just consists solely of meat-based products. So you don't eat carbs, you don't eat fruit, you just eat your meat. Uh, some pretty interesting claims they have as well. So they claim that it will aid weight loss um, and level out blood sugar levels as well, and also correct mood issues. So it can basically make you feel better, feel more energetic, 
those kind of things. Um, there's no actual sort of backed up research on it, but I'm just from some of the things I've, like no scientific sort of experiments done to prove it, but just sort of some things I've come across, like when you know you Google it and stuff like that, that's kind of some of the benefits they talk about. But yeah, I, I again, keen to pick your brains on that. Like, I guess, like you said before, with the weight loss, I could see why they'd sneak that in there because they're saying, yes, it aids weight loss, but if it would actually aid fat loss, because again, you're obviously not eating carbs, uh, fruits, you know, you're basically cutting out a hell of a lot of types of food. So if you are just eating meat, you might lose weight, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be efficient kind of weight loss. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's, there's, there's a few things we could touch on with the carnivorous diet. Obviously, it's like complete polar opposite to, you know, being vegan essentially. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like the diet was just made up. It's like, fuck you, vegan. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's literally like, yeah. Like, yeah, so obviously, we, we spoke about the importance of, you know, essential amino acids, uh, fatty acids, and uh, obviously the, the different vitamins and nutrients and minerals that you get uh, from a balanced diet. Okay, so by consuming a diet that cons uh, completely consists of uh, just meat-based products, you will definitely get your essential amino acids, you can get your essential fatty acids, you can get some of your vitamins, but not all of them. So you cannot get vitamin, you know, you can't get your vitamin C, um, K and E, generally we get those from from plants, mm. okay? So we need those, they're really vital, uh, uh, vital nutrients to be consuming for, you know, not only antioxidant properties, but also hormone, hormonal properties as well. Okay. And sort of sexual health as well, like particularly with vitamin A, that's got, <coughs> that's got steroid properties, so that's really important for your, you know, your sexual health. Damn. Okay, so that's quite important. Well, you, get and, uh, well, <laughs> you can also you can also get you can also you you, well, you, you can get you can get vitamin A from animal based products, but you have to be eating the liver. And there's oh, also man, that's, a no -go, man. that's just, also yeah. a, so you can you can also say similarly with vitamin B twelve. And there's, there was a um, so the the monks that came over with the Normans. You remember uh, 1066 Battle at Hastings when uh, I remember well, I Mr. Yeah. Godwinson got the, uh, got the old arrow straight through the eyeball. Lovely job. Uh, uh, so the Normans that came over, they came over with uh, rabbits, which weren't native here. They, were, they came Shit. over with rabbits from France. That. And so when they developed their monasteries, they had rabbits so they could eat rabbits throughout the winter. And quite a lot of these monks, you know, started to, you know, to die. And they couldn't work out why. Mm. And then some monks were eating, you know, all of the rabbits, including the kidneys and the liver. And the liver in rabbits contains a decent level of vitamin B12, mm. which they weren't getting from the meat itself, because obviously rabbit meat's very white, so it's very light meat, so it doesn't contain B12, but the liver did. So, so yeah, so that shows you the importance of um, getting getting your, your 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 vitamins, and obviously. So sets. the guys that were eating liver basically survived. I didn't. I died, and the guys that were eating liver were rabbits. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then obviously you're probably thinking, well, yeah, well, that's still eating just a meat-based diet. But then you look at sailors, for example, who were at sea, and they had very, uh, you know, so they'd be eating things, you know, fish and stored meat that they had on board. But obviously they didn't have any access to fruits or vegetables, and they were getting mm. scurvy and passing away because they didn't have vitamin C. Oh, and so they treated like they it. treated them with citrus fruits, and obviously they could recover. And so yeah. you know, your body you know does need these essential nutrients, you know, mm. vitamins, um, vitamins and minerals that mm. you need to get from plants. So you, you yes. Yeah, so is is the meat based diet healthy? No, no, it's not. Mm. Can it achieve weight loss? Yes, it can achieve weight loss. It can achieve fat loss too. But is it optimum for performance? No, because you're not going to get enough carbohydrates. You know, you can you can probably perform a ketogenic diet quite effectively using just meat meat based products. Mm. Uh, but again, ketogenic diets are not optimal for performance because obviously there's a lack of carbohydrates within that diet. Do you still are you still on the keto? Do you still have some carbs? So with keto, mm. now generally with keto, you're trying to minimize carbs entirely. Yeah. So keep well, sure, it's, it's difficult to do. But obviously, you're trying to minimise them under 50 grams a day, generally speaking, to sort of maintain ketosis. Jesus. So, yeah. So the 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 the, the carnivorous diet, with regards to, to weight loss, um, yeah. So if you're if you're watching your calories and you you're in a calorie deficit, you can achieve weight loss. Mm. It's going to be slightly more optimal for getting, uh, you know, retaining muscle mass. Obviously, you, you're you're getting a good amount of protein in, um, you know, especially if you're hitting your protein targets. Um, so yeah, so you can, you can achieve weight loss through that, but as I've said, it's not going to be optimal for performance because we're seriously lacking in 
carbohydrates. Mm. I just can't imagine doing that kind of diet. I thought it would be really that. heavy. Like, you know, I'm going to Tesco to find, find some meat. rabbits and like some medium rare rabbits, you know, it's just, it's just, it'd just be heavy. I mean, like eating a lot of meat like that. In terms of long term health effects, though, because obviously you're saying, um, you know, the monks back in the day and shit were dying because they weren't getting all their nutrients because you have some serious long term side effects as well if you were just eating meat now. Uh, yeah, I think you, you, you probably would. Uh, because, uh, yeah, there's only going to be a, a length. You would have to be supplementing for your vitamins. Uh, you know, like, like vitamin C, for example, is just a standout, mm. standout example. Just because I know everyone's thinking it, but no one wants to bring it up again. Where'd you get vitamin A? Vitamin A, so you, get vitamin, you can get vitamin A from, from, from liver. You also get it from you know, fatty sources of fish as well. Okay, so, cod, so you, you can get, get it. You know, you get your cod liver oil, uh, which has got omega yeah, 3 It's also got very high levels of vitamin D. Yeah. And vitamin A, vitamin mm. A. It's got loads of vitamin A and cod liver oil. Okay. It's just interesting. So, you know, when you think of like meat, you think, oh, it makes you really manly. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. I'm about to get in bed with someone. Like, you know what I mean? But actually, it's like I'm about to get in bed yeah, with someone. Yeah, I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? But actually, you're just going you know, before you know going out with your girlfriend or whatever. You go yeah. and put some salmon in the oven. You're like, just give me a second, love. But you know, put your salmon in, yeah. and you're ready to go. That's right. But you can also get <laughs> a vitamin A uh, precursor, um, which is like a, a basically a chemical which basically goes on to produce, which your body metabolizes into. Vitamin A within the body, right? Okay, um, which is called carotene, uh, and you can get this from a vegetable source. And I reckon you're probably thinking, well, I know what, which vegetable that is. The old carrots. Yeah, they help you see in the dark. And there is some. Uh, there's so a little bit of truth. There's, there's a little bit of truth in that. It's not. As, it's not going to have the same amount of truth to it as actual vitamin A. But carotene mm. is a is a useful precursor. It's got very good antioxidant properties. Carotene, but. Um, we, 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 we metabolize that within the body to basically create vitamin A. And vitamin A has got a really important role in eye health as well. Mm, so yeah, uh, hence true. why it says eat your carrots if you had to see in the dark. Yeah. So there is some truth in that, but it's not entirely factual. But you can get, carotene is a very important antioxidant uh, nutrient. So yeah. Okay. yeah, so eat your carrots. I heard it makes you more orange as well, where it gives you a bit more of a tan. Carrots. carrots, yeah. Who told you that? <laughs> it's a myth. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I My mum used to say it. She's like, you'll get more more tanned if you have some carrots. So like, <laughs> just to get me to eat more stuff. You know, your I, parents always come up with that. I actually heard that um, carrots used to be purple, and they genetically changed them to orange to make them more sort of aesthetically appealing to people when they what? like go to eat them. Well, you can get purple carrots. Did they actually? Were they actually ever orange? Did they change, or do you know? You're not sure. Uh, I, I, I don't know for sure, but I think that's highly unlikely. I think that oh, the, there's, defi- there's definitely there's why there carrots? Are, you got like aubergine and grapes and stuff. Like, actually, yeah. I don't because maybe it's like a dirty kind of purple. Yeah, there are there are definitely purple carrots that you can get, and obviously the we have we have our orange. The OG but, yeah. Yeah. Um, on the kind of diet as well, just another thing: uh, blood sugar levels as well. Yeah, would it have a massive sort of impact on that? Or? Well, yeah. Well, obviously, it's gonna. You're, you're not having any carbohydrates, so you're not gonna get any blood sugar spikes throughout the day. Because obviously, you're not gonna be eating any sugar. Um, so obviously, your blood sugar levels are gonna be quite low. Mm. Um, but obviously, you haven't got any stored glycogen, and you're gonna have to. Your body's gonna have to go through gluconeogenesis, like we talked about before, where your body's gonna have to undergo a process where it creates its own glucose to use as energy when you train. So it's gonna have to use amino acids from proteins and meat sources and fatty acids from fats yeah. from the animal sources to make to make your glucose for the uh, so yeah in, in, in order for you to use the glucose as energy but um, yeah that's not terribly not terribly efficient as far as performance goes yeah um, so summarize so, you probably would recommend carnival diet for anyone no I, I, I definitely wouldn't recommend it yeah um, I think you know it, yeah it's, it's, it's not it's not a healthy sustainable diet to be doing Fucking motorbikes, man. Jesus. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and then another thing that is obviously massively popular at the moment is meal replacement shakes and dietary supplements, which a lot of people use to aid weight loss. Uh, so companies you have are sort of like Herbalife. Yeah, that one, yeah. Yeah, Herbalife, I don't think you've ever heard of them before. Uh, what was <laughs> yeah, the one you mentioned? So, uh, yeah, it was Huel. So Huel. it's H-U-E-L. Yeah. And so. then there's... Um, Herbalife as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Herbalife, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then Huel. <laughs> and then there's um, Herbalife. Herbalife, yeah, yeah that's yeah. the one. Yeah, I think it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, Huel. I think. I mean, I think they both have the same kind of meal replacement thing. But I remember. I, I feel like there's more companies as well, which is probably common. Yeah, maybe. I mean, for me, the experience of what I saw with Huel is that, and you get like a free shirt with it as well, which my mate was thought was pretty cool. But my housemate had it. And look, you're just smiling about it already. Um, and basically, yeah, I remember because I tried it as well because it was like an it was like an unflavored shake as well. Unflavored. It was like yeah, it was like unflavored. Like it had like some weird flavor. It was yeah, and you'd have like certain time periods which you drink it, 
And yeah, he used to just drink that and he said, yeah, that didn't, I mean, I think, I don't know if he was doing it for weight loss, if he was just trying to save himself on cooking, but it tasted so grim. I feel like there's a lot of influencers just spam the shit out of it on Dude, what, Ronaldo is sponsored by Herbalife, man. Like, Ronaldo is sponsored by Herbalife. Ronaldo? Ronaldo. Is he? Yeah, man. No. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, he's gone down my estimation a little bit there. Are you <laughs> so, serious? Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think he actually takes it, probably. I think he just literally... I, I actually didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. But, um, yeah, sorry, we kind of went off of them. But, yeah, pretty much Jordan Herbalife are the ones. I mean, what are your thoughts on, like, meal replacement shakes rather than just eating normally, pretty much? Yeah, so, obviously, when we, you know, when we eat food... We undergo that process, mastication, that we spoke about before, you chew the food. Mm. Okay, that's quite important for sparking off quite a few things in the body which are going to help us to digest that food very efficiently and get as much nutrients from that food as we can. Okay, so obviously when we chew the food we start releasing enzymes in the mouth but also you release different hormones within the body which regulate you know, satiety, so like how full you feel, how satisfied you feel from mm. that meal. Mm. And um, just from chewing, yeah, just from well, just from chewing, yeah. Okay. Um, but well, also chewing, and then also the stretching of the stomach as well. When once we contain food within the stomach, right. that's going to suppress your. There's a hormone called uh, ghrelin, which basically ghrelin is sort of responsible for making you feel hungry. So, you know, when you like see food and you get the saliva in your mouth, and that's going to make you feel more hungry. Mm. Uh, that, that's ghrelin really sort of doing bits for you there. Okay. okay? So obviously, when our stomach starts. To You've, we've, we, the body recognises mastication, and then we have the stretching of the stomach lining, and then it responds and actually decreases that ghrelin level, and you get increased feeling of satiety. Okay, so obviously, you know, if you skip that process, firstly through there's no mastication, and then just by having you know shake for that meal, mm. you're not going to fill that stomach capacity fully. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, you're, yeah, still gonna, yeah. you're not going to feel necessarily satisfied. Now, yeah. I do understand that you know a few of these companies that do do these meal based sh- uh, the meal replacement shakes you know use uh, you know fiber within the, the shake which is fine and that is going to have a bit more of a, a slow digestive effect and allow you a bit more of an opportunity to absorb some more of those nutrients from that from the from from the shake um, but but again you're, you're not really going to achieve that same level of satiety from that meal that you would do had you've consumed a proper you know well balanced meal mm. Um, so what are like, the negative effects of not having that satiety, would you say? Like, well, you're going to feel more hungry. You're just going to feel more hungry. Yeah, you're so you're going to drink it and you're still going to want to just have another one, or you're just either going to want to have another shake or you're just going to still want to eat something, yeah. basically. So you're going to feel more hungry. Yeah. You're also not going to be able to absorb as many nutrients as you would, you would want to, ideally. So again, so right. for, for performance basis, mm-hmm. that's going to be, you know, that's going to be, it's going to tarnish our performance. It's going right. to be detrimental to performance. Yeah. Um, you know, second, secondly, also, obviously, if you're trying to preserve muscle mass, obviously, if you're not absorbing as much nutrients as you as you need from mm. those meals, mm. meal replacement shakes, sorry, yeah, <laughs> then you are going to, uh, yeah, sure. Again, you're 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 it's going to make it a bit hard for your body to hang on to that that muscle mass mm. sustainably, sure. So for a long period of time. Now, I think it has has to be said that there are some benefits to shake based diets, which would be. Obviously, like I said before, the easiest diet for you is always going to be the one that's easiest for you to follow. So it's very easy for you to follow. You you know you have a shake instead of a meal. You're on the go. It's easy for you to do. You take some tablets to get your your vitamins in. But is that surely that can't be as good as actual vitamins you would get from food, though, and actual yeah. protein and, and carbs you would get from food. Yeah, so it's, it's like, like synthetic. Yeah, kind of nutrients. So obviously, yeah. In some of these products, you get high levels of sugar. Not all of them. In some of them, you get high levels of sugar. Obviously, we, we want to be avoiding that, ideally. Okay, because obviously that's going to spike our insulin, and obviously we don't really we want to try and avoid that generally, unless it's straight after a training period. Okay, and then also, um, yeah. So when it, when it, when it, yeah, it's. <laughs> It's a stressful one, to be fair. But yeah, but there, there, are, there, are, there are benefits to doing it in the, in the sense that it is, it's, it's easy, easy for you to do and it makes that, that, that can be easy for you to do and it's going to be easy for you to maintain a calorie deficit because you don't have to prepare all these meals. Mm. But similarly, you're not going to get the full amount of nutrients that you want, that your body needs from those, from those meals. And then also, in our plant-based products, you know, we've got different phytochemicals like you know, like I mentioned before, like flavonoids, which play key roles in vasodilation and that sort of thing, which are important for our circulatory health and reducing inflammation and that sort of thing. And you get that through your food, through eating food. Okay, so different different plants like leafy green, le- leafy greens and 
and beetroot and that sort of thing. And obviously, if you're not getting a well balanced meal, you're going to miss out on those phytochemicals as well. So, you know, there are added benefits to having, you know, proper food uh, for overall health and well being. Um, yeah, I, and for the sustainability. The other thing I wanted to go yeah. into is obviously. Sorry to cut you off there. No, no, you're right. uh, just you know, by having a you know replacing your meals with shakes, that is not developing a healthy relationship with food for you. Mm. So you're 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 not actually going to be benefiting from that in the long run. You're not going to know, you know, you know, not going to get better discipline with obviously you know cooking your meals and you know appreciating the food that you know you're able to eat. And you know, so yeah, I think obviously you can, you, can, you can stray down a, a, a dangerous line there where. You know, is it sustainable? You know, possibly not. You know, if you start going back to food and you're like, oh my, yeah, just missed out how good donuts were, and then <laughs> off you go. Um, but yeah, you want to be able to, you know, learn how to eat food sustainably and to uh, integrate that within your within your daily life and in your diet. Mm. Yeah. So what you're saying is, if you were on, say, like a shake based diet for a month or even two months, if you went back to normal food, that's where like binging can occur and so those yeah, bad habits can come definitely. back. Yeah. And especially when you've got a very light, you have very high calorie deficit involved. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. I know you kind of went on to it a little bit last episode, but just like, yeah, some of the calorie deficits are quite extreme, I feel, yeah. on those kind of shake-based diets. Like, yeah. you know, excess of 600 up to like a 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 calorie deficits per day. Yeah. So if, if you're, you know, if you're sort of, you know, within a normal bracket of individuals and, you know, your BMI is in sort of a healthy range, then you know that there is no need for you to be putting yourself in that calorie deficit, and that's not going to be beneficial for your health at all, really, mm. and definitely not sustainably. If you put yourself in a calorie deficit for an extended period of time, where you're, you know, in excess of six to, you know, to a thousand calories, um, you know, that's that's far. To, you know, you're you're really limiting your body with what it can actually do with that, and th- th- you're going to have issues with that later down the line because your body is basically going to react to that, and your body's very intelligent at understanding. You know whether it's getting enough nutrients or not and if it's not getting enough nutrients to be able to perform on a daily basis then your body's actually going to start to hang on to fat tissue more so your body goes into what's called starvation mode and really recognizes that you're not you know getting enough energy from your food mm. and so it says right well, we're not going to burn any more fat we're going to start you know using our muscle uh, through gluconeogenesis to start fueling ourselves and we're going to try and go through several physiological changes to prevent, you know, further fat loss so that we cling on to fat so that we can continue to survive. And so, you know, in that sense, that's not, not really what you want. Do you want to get skinnier but still be fat? It's, it doesn't yeah, really yeah. make sense. I see what you're saying. Like, yeah, you, might, you might lose like a shit ton of weight in four or five weeks, but long term, it's actually going to be harder for you to lose that weight again if you needed to for some reason. Or yeah, definitely. Just but then also that weight, that weight you're losing, you know, it's not going to improve your aesthetics. Yeah. Or your performance for that matter. And then the other problem is, is obviously when you go from there, going back to, you know, maintenance calories or above, um, your body's going to react to that very aggressively and start to, you, it, your body wants to store more fat because it was put in a starvation period. Yeah. You were in a really heavy calorie deficit. Your body's like, right, well, we need to be ready because we could, we could undergo this again. Yeah, um, so that's, that's related to epigenetics where your body goes through some, some, like sort of genetic changes by itself to help prevent that, that damage and will prevent that trauma later later down the line should it should it come about again. Yeah, it's like you're probably not like PTSD from freaking weight loss. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Okay. Yeah, so it's not not probably not the nicest analogy to use. Yeah. But <laughs> no, it's no, cool we, though, yeah, yeah, we, yeah it, sh- it shocks your body and your body responds. Yeah. Like, your body is incredibly intelligent. Yeah. So it, it just responds that and says, right, motherfucker, you're not going to do this to us again. Yeah. 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 Watch this. <laughs> so. <laughs> Skinny fat, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, some people think that's like the worst aesthetic to be skinny fat. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, no one's yeah. like skinny fat. Yeah, man. But um, where, yeah, it's okay. where this diet can be beneficial for individuals if if you're in uh, you know the obese demographic of individuals, so your BMI is in excess of thirty. Uh, but especially if you're an individual who is not only obese but also has uh, type two diabetes, and if you reduce your calories significantly down to um, there was a study that was recently done up at Newcastle University where they reduced the calorie intake to 800 calories a day and had that consumed just through shakes and they ensured that the shakes contained all the, vit- all the vitamins and minerals that they needed including proteins generally as the main macronutrient um, and the fatty acids that we need of course and they sustained that 800 calories so that was just 800 calories total for eight weeks eight weeks yeah and these individuals can you know had significant weight loss and decrease their weight. They also dropped their 
drop their body fat, of course, mm-hmm. and also their fat around their pancreas. And so obviously, as you know, your, your pancreas is where you secrete your um, insulin from. And obviously insulin is basically related to type 2 yeah. di- diabetes, mm-hmm. okay? And it was, it was showing that in, uh, in this experiment, um, the, 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 the diabetes uh, within these individuals was reversed in 83% of these individuals wow. through that 800 calorie uh, that, that, that restricted 800 calories just through shakes. So all these people had type 2 diabetes are in the experiment? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, but then after that, yeah. what, what the study leaders did, which I thought was brilliant, is they, they then went through to teach the people to have a better, uh, better relationship with food thereafter. So it's not just... It's just so they, 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 yeah, yeah, so they recognise that you know, the, the, this shake-based diet it is not sustainable. And so in order, for, in order for their diet to be sustainable, they have to be eating a proper, you know, proper diet and have, mm. build a healthier relationship with food to prevent it happening in the future. So they then had seminars and sort of lessons and, and, and food packs teaching them how to cook different meals sure. uh, to, 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 to prolong that for, for, for longer term and make it more sustainable for those individuals. So in that case, if you are in that demographic, then a shake-based diet where you're seriously calorie restricted could be beneficial. Yeah. If you're obese and you have type 2 diabetes. That's the thing. Then that can be beneficial for you. Yeah. Um, it, it sounds quite, sorry to cut you off there, but like, as in, especially for a type 2 diabetic, sometimes they do need to lose weight pretty quickly or they need to do something really drastically. So sometimes, like you say, maybe it actually would be beneficial for to, to go on something like that. I know you, says it, you say it always depends on what works for you as well, but like, for example, in that kind of case, maybe for some of them, like the doctors say, okay, you need to really yeah, yeah. change yeah. it up now. In, so in that instance, it's not about what works for you; it's about what doing. What in that? Yeah, you need to do. Needs, you need to do. You need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. If, if you don't adhere to that diet and that that you lose that fat loss, then mm. you're you yeah you obviously you know type two diabetes has got a strong correlation with cardiovascular disease and various other things, mm. and so you're you're, you're just you're, you're basically restricting your life expectancy massively and your mm. quality of life. So. Yeah, obviously by putting yourself in that calorie deficit, you lose a lot of body fat and you, yeah. re- you re- reduce the fat that's stored around your pancreas so your pancreas can more readily release insulin into the bloodstream and then you can start using insulin for what it's supposed to be used for and storing, yeah. st- controlling and regulating uh, blood sugar levels and homeostasis within the body. Yeah. So even though it's quite a niche that it would be beneficial for? Yeah, so that shape-based diet where you're, you're restricting calories so harshly is, would be beneficial for that demographic, but only for that short period of time. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. not sustainable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in a And these 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 individuals are sedentary; they're not performing exercise. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. for for an athlete, a shake based diet and a high calorie deficit, yeah, don't yeah. do it. It's yeah. not going to help you. We have a lot of people as well because obviously it's so popular, like weight loss kind of diets and programs now. What would you say is like a healthy, sustainable calorie deficit that people should look at doing? Because obviously, at least then people have knowledge of where, like, if they see a diet where it's like, do this diet, you're in an 800 or 1,000 calorie deficit, then obviously, you know, listening to that, they'll be like, okay, well, that's not actually healthy for me long term. What would you say is like a typical good sort of deficit that you want to be looking at? Yeah, so a good the deficit that you want to be looking at, you'd start, uh, obviously, you want to know what your maintenance calories are. So those are the calories that your body's going to need. So to just stay at the same weight essentially okay yeah. so taking that into consideration that'd be your bmr plus the exercise and activity that you're doing throughout the day and you know your uh thermal effect of food so the energy you need to break down certain foods okay so yeah so a sensible calorie deficit to put yourself in to start with would just be 10 percent reduction 10 percent reduction it, there's no one size fits all with this so if you say to someone go up to anybody so you could go up to somebody who's 23 stone and six foot three and say, oh, you want to reduce your calories by 600 calories. And then you could go up to, you know, a, a woman who's, you know, five foot three and weighs, what, 70 kilos and say, oh, you need to reduce your calorie intake by 600 calories. That's just not sensible. Yeah, yeah. You know, both those cases, you think you, it's got to be relatable to that individual, their weight, their calories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, because they have different needs. Their body has, com- those two body types are completely different. Yeah, yeah. You know, not only are they different sexes, but they're also, they also have different weights, and so and they might be performing different exercises. So that, that, that's not relatable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it yeah. has to be specific to that individual. Yeah. So I would start with any individual and would say, right, we want to be reducing calories by ten percent to start with, and then you you monitor that. Mm-hmm. So you, you it's 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 all a learning process. You work out what works for the individual. Everybody's 
you know, like I said before, human beings are beautifully different. Mm -hmm. We all metabolize things ever so slightly differently. We all respond to things ever so slightly differently. Okay, so I would start there and then you continue to, you would decrease it in 10% chunks on a sort of three to four week basis. But you want to get yourself down to a target, um, you know, target body fat reduction. Um, so for, for, for a bloke, that would be what, around the 10% mark. Um, if you're a, you know, a bloke and you want to get below you know, 5%, like you know, professional bodybuilders, that is, that's not healthy and that's not sustainable because your body has an essential body fat of about 7%. So 7% is about the body fat that your body needs to be able to sustain you know, proper, proper sexual health and hormonal health because your body uses fats to produce different hormones. Mm. Um, so if you go below that fat percentage for an extended period of time, that's going to be really detrimental to your health. It, it always cracks me up because like, the amount of times I've been on my out and guys will just be like, yeah bro, I'm fucking 5% body What's fat. What's that about? Like, no, you're fucking not. Why do they always boast that? See, the amount of people that come to me are like, yeah, yeah, I'm 5% body fat at the moment. And like, they'll be just, like, over like periods of like months, Five percent body fat. I'm just like, yeah, all right, mate. Yeah, that's how. Yeah. That was year one point, wasn't it? When you're getting your grenade bars right, up, then then like five percent body fat. Five percent <laughs> oh, no. well, body fat is extremely lean. Like that's very, like, that's like very, very, very top like, level bodybuilders yeah. stepping onto that Olympia stage might be able to get there, and they're using more assistance than just diet yeah. to get yeah. there because it's very difficult to do that. Well, now, well, with with women, it's different. So women, you know, biologically, women are designed to hold a little bit more fat than males. Yeah. Uh, because they have, yes, yeah, so they have a higher essential fatty acids. So it's essentially that would be around uh, thirteen percent of their body weight should be is their essential fat that they need to be able to produce their hormones. Not only to produce their hormones, but to look after offspring should they, you know, get pregnant and have have, have an infant. Okay, so with with women, for example, when you see a woman who's you know really shredded in really good nick, she's not sub ten percent. She's going to be more like sub twenty. Yeah. But she holds it a lot better because they've got a lot of, um, you know, uh, fat stored in, her, in, in and around our organs, mm -hmm. in and around her organs, which she's going to be using uh, to help sustain her sexual health and her health in general. So, yeah. So you know, in those two cases, you know, there's one no one size fits all with regards to reducing calories by a massive chunk. You know, you've got to be meticulous to that individual and make sure that individual is getting the, the micronutrients and their essential. You know, amino acids that I spoke about before, and essential fatty acids as well as our new, as our minerals and vitamins. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. Um, and then lastly, I guess we were going to cover um, game changes you wanted to touch on again, and just vegan diets um, in general, and talk about like the difference in protein you get from meat and plant-based protein. I did I did a bit of research as well because I just wanted to kind of see what information is out there. For people that as well that maybe like oh I'm, you know I'm thinking about becoming vegan I want to see you know what are the pros what are the cons uh, I found quite some quite interesting I guess kind of statements where um, so it's verywellfit.com I was on um, and basically some of the things they're saying you have a reduced risk of disease uh, improved weight control complete nutrition um, more food variety which to me I found my in fact like that was quite hard for me to wrap my head around because you're basically cutting out a whole form of nutrition but yet yeah, you somehow have more variety. Um, and then also reduce food costs. That's again very subject to where you're buying your food, what sort of you know types of food you're buying as well. Um, and then obviously environmental impact um, and ethical treatment of animals. Uh, before you go into it, I guess you can correct me on anything. But the only one I kind of actually, to be pretty honest, really agreed with was obviously the ethical treatment of animals. That's you know what guys are saying. That's pretty obvious. But even like the environmental impact, I'm not 100% sure that's accurate. Um, and then like I said, food variety, um, improved weight control, etc. Again, that's a very case by case scenario. They're, I find that they're quite blanket statements where you know it's not like every single vegan is slimmer than every other person who doesn't eat, who, who eats meat. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I just found it interesting. Like, I, I think yeah, the information out there is very kind of just blanket statements. I think for ethical reasons, you know, clearly it's a good option. Yeah, eth ethically, yeah, if that's the way that you feel, then yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah stick to that and do that. You know, that's, that's what you believe in, that's great. And so do that. Um, with regards to the environment, yes, there's obviously there's obviously data showing that it, you know, it'd be beneficial for the environment if uh, people sway towards vegan diets, but obviously we've got to consider that we'd have to use a lot more ground to produce different, you know, more vegetables for everybody. Yeah. Um, so that has to be considered, but yes, there is, there, is, there, is, there, is, there is data to show that that would be the case. So those two statements, yes, I'd say they're valid. Okay. Okay, but moving on from there with everything else, 
everything else. If you're eating a well-balanced diet, you can achieve all of those things if you're eating the right things and having a healthy diet. Yeah. So, yeah, so like reduce disease risk. You know, if you're eating, if you're eating the Mediterranean diet, for example, which yeah. I would consider to be the best diet health-wise, in the, you know, that is available to consume. So, that that's gonna give you all of those things and better food variety because you're not excluding, you know. Um, uh, products from animal sources. Yeah, that cracked me up. It was like more food variety, like more. You cut out a whole source of food. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I, yeah, I'd say that those statements are yeah misleading and inaccurate. Yeah. Uh, but the the the, the 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 ethical ethical reasons. Yeah, the that's awesome. ones. You know, you you got some validity behind those. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the the other statements though, I think are yeah pretty inaccurate. Yeah. Uh, but to touch on a bit more detail, sort of animal-based proteins versus plant-based proteins, like what is the crack, you know, what, what is the difference? Um, so essentially, with, with regards to, you know, animal-based proteins and plant-based proteins, they're, they're slightly different in, uh, in structure as well. So animal-based proteins generally come in sort, of, in sort of like a twisting structure. So these proteins aren't just like little things, they're actually developed into shape, into shapes, sort of much more like, quite similar to DNA in respect, you've probably seen that. Yeah, yeah, like the chains, yeah. Diagrams, yeah. so that's called an alpha double helix, whereas, um, whereas protein would be just in one helix, so it's just circled around like so. Mm. And then you get another design of protein, which is really tough, uh, which is generally what our, like, uh, our connective tissue is made out of, which is uh, called a beta pleated sheet. So they're like sheets of protein sort of webbed together um, connected through different sulfur bonds um, and that's really really tough uh, and like with regards to, to digesting that it's very difficult to digest that because it's such a complicated structure uh, in, in when compared with the alpha helix so generally it's considered that um, well it, it, it is is fact that the the animal based proteins are generally more uh, alpha helix and they are much more easy easily digested in the body than the beta pleated sheets, which are uh, present in plant-based proteins. Okay. The other thing, obviously, the difference between animal-based proteins and plant-based proteins. Generally, plant-based proteins within the plant itself, there's a lot of fiber around around the protein, so that makes it a lot harder for our enzymes to to, to latch onto that protein to start breaking it down. Okay. So again, that's going to reduce the digestibility of that protein. Okay, and then the other thing that's present in quite a lot of plants is uh, is, 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 is phytases and such other chemicals, um, which basically uh, they basically um, form complexes with our enzymes. So what they do, so our enzymes are used to sort of break the proteins down into smaller peptides and amino acids, which are just smaller chunks, basically, so your body can absorb it. Yeah. Um, so what these phytases do is they in inactivate these enzymes, so your enzymes can no longer break down that protein. And that's the protein you get from plants you're on about? Yeah, so with, within plants they contain these chemicals. Okay. And these plants have these chemicals naturally to help stop insects from eating them. Yeah. So the insect comes to eat the plant and these phytases basically stop the, stop the insect from digesting protein and makes them ill. So essentially slightly, slightly toxic. Mm. So, you know, beans, yeah, kidney beans have these, which is why you treat beans. So with, if you treat vegetables, obviously you can reduce the levels of these phytases and and other chemicals so that you can digest the protein in there a bit more efficiently. Um, and then so obviously, so that's basically what we're trying to summarize there is that the, 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 the plant-based protein is a lot harder to obtain and absorb than an animal-based protein. So it's less, less, di less easily digested, so it's not, not as easily digestible, okay? So the other thing obviously is that we go on to quality now. So the quality of the protein, so generally, we, we talk we talk about amino acid profiles, and they say am incomplete amino acid profile with regards to plant plant based proteins. Okay, when compared with animal based proteins, what I mean by that is you've got our essential amino acids, which you know, like lysine, leucine, isoleucine, uh, histidine. These are all these are all amino acids that our body can't make itself. Okay. So we need these from our diet to be able to do important roles within the body. Okay, so. If we don't have those, then obviously certain processes, you know, like protein synthesis, for example, you know, muscle growth and repair, which is heavily driven by the amino acid leucine, is going to start to become, you know, impaired. Okay, and generally most plant-based products are very low in that particular amino acid, leucine. And the other, the other amino acid that some plant, most plant-based products are low in is lysine. So, 
if you are going to be having a you know you know plant based protein, it's generally going to be quite you're not going to get a complete profile. So what I mean by a complete profile is that that protein is not going to contain a hundred percent of your RDA of that essential amino acid. So it might contain some of it, but not all of it. And so you need to top that up. And so the easiest way to do that, if you are vegan or, or vegetarian, well, yeah, just vegan, just keep it simple, um, you want to have different sources of grains. So like maize, for example, maize actually contains quite a high level of leucine, but it's got an extremely low level of lysine. And so you would have to complement that by having you know, another grain to go alongside that, like, like your beans, for example. Yeah. Okay, so that would then help you to get closer to achieving a full amino acid profile. So that the protein quality of you know what that protein contains when, with with regards to plants is considerably lower than it is with you know with animal based proteins and um, uh, yeah so so Brad Schoenfeld who's a very well respected uh, sports scientist uh, is second most cited sports scientist you know in the, globally and you know when confronted with the question you know are plant based proteins of high quality he just said no, they're just not. You know, in comparison to an animal-based protein, where you have a complete amino acid profile every time, and you've got everything you need from that one one source of protein, yeah. it's considerably easier. Which is considerably easier for your body to digest. You know, without those, you know, without those enzyme inhibitors and without the fiber, mm. it's it, yeah. So, and I know you. Sorry, I know you're going to end up repeating yourself a little bit, but just to touch on again, kind of like the longer term effects of not having those complete proteins. What, what are some of the things you know people could find? Like, because a lot of people as well might go vegan and like, you know, after a month, like, oh, I feel so much better, I feel way healthier, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but like, yeah, like I said, like long term as well, or even short term, like what are some of the sort of negatives I guess you can have if you're not making sure you're covering, you know, all, all grounds and getting all those different kind of areas of amino, acid, amino um, chains and proteins in your body? Yeah, so, yeah, generally, you're, you, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to recover as, as efficiently. There are plant-based proteins actually out there which do contain better levels of leucine, but obviously it's not comparable to of animal sources. Mm. So like I said, maize has got very good high levels. But, uh, you know, pea and rice proteins, they're slightly better, more complete than like a soy protein, for example. So they're slightly better. They're getting better, but they're not as good as animal sources, such as whey or yeah. eggs, for example. Um, you know, without, without using genetic engineering, and, and selective breeding within plants, which you could use in the future to create better, more complete proteins in plants. But yeah. with regards to you know what what, what you're going to suffer, you're going to suffer uh, your, your your protein synthesis, your rate of recovery. That's going to be hampered. That's going to decline. Okay, and obviously if you're trying to if you're trying to sort of maintain a, a calorie deficit, but get enough protein so that you maintain a lean body mass. It's going to be very difficult to do that on a plant-based product, plant products because as we said before, in order to hit your protein target, it's going to have to consume more calories because you're going to have to consume more food volume to not only get enough protein for your, for, for, for your uh, body to, con- to maintain that lean muscle mass, but you need to take into account that, that wastage because the, pl- the plant-based protein isn't as biologically available as, yeah. as, as the animal-based protein. So you're going to have to take into account that wastage and that loss that you're not going to be able to benefit from. So yeah, so your your rate of protein synthesis is going to be dramatically in, uh, r- dramatically reduced through the you know through incomplete um, incomplete proteins. In terms of like bone structure, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, you're wedgy then, mate. No, I got cramped in my hamstring. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, guys, I'm leaning up. I'm like, what's going on with this right now? <laughs> <laughs> you know when leg day hits, right. your hamstring just completely spazzes out. Do you need me to put it? Like, <laughs> so I'll just stroke my leg. Next thing you know, quad's gonna crack, isn't it? Yeah, I was gonna say. All exciting stuff. Yeah. God, Give him a look at fucking Christ. Oh, that, that? <laughs> <laughs> that oh, Jesus. Do you know what? The viewers never realize that she's trying to show off his legs right now. That's actually the real reason what's going yeah, on right now. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Jesus Christ. Do you know what? It's because you've not been eating enough of your amino acids and it looks like you're, <laughs> cra- you're cramping up a little bit. That's it. It's the coffee, mate. The coffee's well, I mean, dehydrating. More, more, more to my electrolyte and balance, I would, I would expect. You too got much, a, too you much got, coffee. Yeah. So how many coffees have you had today? Uh, two. Two, okay. Two. I thought like that wouldn't really make much, much of a problem, I guess, but 
<laughs> well, that was all good. <laughs> Anybody listening who's ever had hamstring cramp knows just oh, how uncomfortable that was for me just there. Yeah, there it was because you started grimacing. I was like, Yeah, I thought it was a wedgie. <laughs> I thought he was kind of coming up and smiling. I'm like, What's going on here? Yeah, now my quads cramping as well. Great fun. Yeah, lovely job. That can happen. So, you know, you see those people that do podcasts for like three hours straight. I'm just like, How the hell did they do that? Uh, We've done an hour and we're like, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 pro- they probably haven't trained first. True. Oh, so, true, actually. Yeah, that's true as well. You know, he's about to train afterwards as well. Yeah. But, yeah. And, um, I guess, okay. did you talk standing up? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll talk standing up. Yeah. Uh, what was I asking? Uh, oh, yeah, like, in terms of, like, bone structure and stuff like that, could it have, like, a negative impact longer term? Yeah, so, obviously, if you if you, if you your protein synthesis rate is, uh, is hampered by, you know, digesting proteins which have an incomplete amino acid profile, and you start to reduce your muscle mass, particularly in elderly individuals, like we, talk, well, like we talked about yeah, earlier, yeah. your musculoskeletal health is going to be seriously impaired. You're going you're gonna to experience muscle loss, and that's going to you know, weaken your skeletal structure. Cool. And so you could expect that. So there's a key correlation, like I said last time, to that in hip fractures, and obviously that's costing the NHS millions of pounds every year. I think it's two million pounds a year, at least at the moment, just in hip fractures in the elderly. Um, so, so, yeah, so obviously it's... Especially in elderly individuals where you, you, you're going to have a higher demand for protein because as you become elderly, your body becomes less efficient at absorbing proteins anyway. Yeah, so if you're yeah. giving your body a, uh, a protein source which is not of a good quality anyway, and you have, to di- you have to try and get a lot more from that, but your body's not as, not as efficient at absorbing it and digesting it, then you're putting yourself at a serious disadvantage. So yeah, you could expect to have some muscular skeletal health issues. Sorry, yeah. Well, um, hopefully, did you, is there anything else you wanted to ask? No, I mean, I was watching Henry standing up, but it feels oh, like, you know, when you're at like, university, about like, in reception, you're about to do a presentation, you've got to stand up to the class. Like, that's how I feel with Henry right now. <laughs> um, but, no, I mean, yeah, I think most points have been covered. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. But. No, yeah, hopefully, um, that kind of just, I just wanted to basically today just try and give everyone like a decent overview of different types of diets, some of the pros, some of the cons, and just basically give sort of truthful, factual information, no like hidden agenda. It's not like, you know, we're trying to sort of sell one particular type of eating method or diet more than the other. Mm. Um, so yeah, and I think, yeah, we'll, we'll probably just wrap it up there so Henry can uh, stretch that grandpa. Well, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we'll have Henry on, obviously, for more episodes regarding nutrition. Um, I think Henry might even try a vegan diet for a month. I don't know if that's going to be in the oh, works. Well, no, commit to that. If he can commit <laughs> yeah, to it, yeah, then yeah. yeah. Give, um, give, give it a go. Exactly, exactly. And then, yeah, if this is the first time you listen to Henry's, um, of Henry being on our podcast, then obviously you can follow him on Instagram. It's, how's it go again? This? Yeah, Henry Barlow Fit UK. Yeah. So we've got an underscore in between the end of Barlow and then Fit in UK. Yeah. So, so it's Henry Barlow underscore fit, fit underscore UK. Yeah. That's the one. That's and, the one. Um, yeah, pretty much. Just go check him out. He's got some really cool stories as well. Um, if you want to check out his calves as well, then you'll see them on your st- in his story most of the time as well. So yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's we're gonna wrap it up from there. Yeah, see you guys for the next episode. Been a pleasure, gents. Yeah, peace. Cheers.